Um, and hi, everyone. I trust that you're all having a wonderful day. Um, so today I wanted to talk about um, the Launch Center on a Martian Habitat. This was part of a virtual analog space mission that we did at Habitat Marty. It's physically located in Brazil, um, but typically has participants from all over the world. Right. So this was, um, so amongst a couple of missions that we did, this was the latest one. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So today we will cover the role that the launch center would play in a Martian habitat, some technological and design considerations, and then we'll end finally with a few visual concepts of the center itself. So the role of the launch center, um, so, sorry, the, the launch center is part of the habitat that is responsible for um, arriving and departing spaceships. These ships could bring cargo, equipment, people um, from Earth or from Martian space. For simplicity, I've tried to organize um, the launch center's role in two or three. So the first is to act as a spaceport. Its role in this regard is very similar to airports on Earth. So ships with cargo and people will arrive and depart from these facilities fueling of ships, maintenance of equipment, um, and in a some future state, you also have um, traffic control and scheduling of ships. Um, and given the, the dusty atmosphere, fluctuating temperatures, um, it's quite likely that we'll need to secure ships within facilities on the premises. Um, and a final concern would also be building and maintaining the launch pad region. And the second category I have is logistical operations, um, where cargo and people that have that have arrived will need to be shuttled between the launch center and other facilities within the habitat. And the final category is mining. Um, and in the habitat design that we were looking at, um, we didn't really have a dedicated facility for mining. Um, and since it's really likely that early on traffic at the launch center is going to be like scattered and infrequent, um, during the downtime, it just makes sense to utilize the facility and premises for um, fuel and water generation from Martian regolith and storing, storing all these excavated materials as well as transporting them to other part of the habitat um, will be part of the launch center's role. So moving on to some technologies that we would require for the build out. Um, very first, uh, we start out with uh, reusable rockets, the kind that SpaceX's Falcon and Starship has made really famous. I'm sure we'll get to hear more from, from Mr. Musk very soon. Um, so these ships will need to bear repeated onslaught from escaping Earth's gravity, six to nine month journey to Mars, descent through the Martian atmosphere, and the worst case, also need to withstand dust storms, temperature fluctuations. Um, a viable alternative could be to, to develop infrastructure invading in low Mars orbit to handle the last mile journey, which might be um, pretty frequent. Um, another ongoing area of research is sample returns. Uh, Dr. Brown covered this topic pretty extensively yesterday, so I'll just gloss over it. Um, the image that you see on the right is a conception of what that mission might look like. Um, it involves a Mars rover, uh, packing samples that it's collected from the surface into test tubes, sealed within a titanium container for, for protection, and a sent vehicle that would have previously landed on Mars and autonomously deployed uh, relaunch capabilities will then launch itself to rendezvous with an Earth orbiter vehicle and using close like loop guidance, it would navigate the lock and transfer uh, the container of samples. And the operator would then be released um, within the Earth's atmosphere for delivery. Container, of course, would need to be able to withstand both launch from Mars as well as atmospheric re-entry into Earth. And thinking ahead, whoa, I think, there we go. <laughs> thinking ahead to fuel systems will also be pretty important. Solid fuels are single start, very familiar with their usage. Uh, spirit, opportunity, curiosity, perseverance have all used solid fuel rocket boosters. SpaceX's Raptor and Merlin engines both use liquid fuel system. One uses methane, the other RP1. Um, a hybrid fuel system would use a solid fuel with a liquid oxidizer. It allows for multiple starts like a liquid fuel system does, but unlike the current liquid fuel systems, um, it has much better low temperature performance. It's still hard to safely achieve high levels of thrust though with it, which continues to be an ongoing area of research. Um, Reaction Dynamics in Canada is testing its hybrid engines um, and they claim to have um, 
to have developed a mechanism to safely to safely achieve sustained thrust um, and they're also claiming to be environmentally friendly so i'm really interested in learning um, what comes out of that test really soon okay um, for launch pad construction now a ship taking off or landing on the martian surface will generate clouds of dust and dirt um, it'll lead to cratering and an increased likelihood of instrument damage. Launchpad construction strategies to mitigate this damage due to plumes will therefore be super important. Two options presented here include a robotically paved and maintained area and an in-flight alumina spray or a fast system. Paving the, paving the area is an expedient solution. Uh, the paving materials could be made from highly compressed regolith or something that we carry on board from Earth. In the fast system, alumina is injected into the exhaust process during landing and it cools immediately on impact with the regolith and forms a layer much like paving wood to prevent cratering. Moving on now to fuel generation. Um, Martian regolith could be used as a source of oxygen and hydrogen water. And here you see the RAS or excavator. It consists of tooth drums on the periphery and hollow drums for storage in the middle. As the tooth drums rotate, uh, the dug up regolith gets loaded into the storage drums. Um, and the current concept here doesn't uh, currently handle um, large chunks of ice that are likely to be encountered in regolith, um, which will be a problem that needs to be solved. And thinking ahead to large scale production, we are likely to require many, many such razors. Swarm robotic systems with decentralized control will certainly protect against failure by sheer redundancy. Um, but that also means that we would need to scale them down, uh, which then brings in a question how effective these tooth drums are likely to be to dig up massive quantities of regolith. All the excavated matter will then be heated to a high temperature to extract water. Um, you'd follow the Sabatier reaction, can be electrolyzed to hydrogen and oxygen at really high temperatures, close to about 400 degrees. And then the hydrogen would need to be stored in liquid form as methane. Um, and you would do that by combining hydrogen with carbon dioxide, which the Martian atmosphere is abundant in. MOXIE, um, which is on board the Perseverance mission right now, will test out some solid state electrolysis of carbon dioxide to produce oxygen. And Dr. Hextock from yesterday elaborated on those details. Methane and oxygen will also both need to be stored cryogenically for use within the habitat and can be transported from the launch center to everywhere else. Um, I'm kind of moving on now to some considerations of design and some basic considerations are listed here. And I'll kind of go through each one of them over the next couple of slides. So starting with autonomous function, um, which will need to be enabled by um, robotic elements would be super critical. Swarms of robots have the advantage that they don't offer single points of failure for the mission. Um, they could be used for mining regolith, for clearing pathways within caves and lava tubes as well as autonomous exploration, building out the initial habs. And the picture you see in the bottom are Offworld's artistic concept of swarm robots on Mars and NASA JPL's lemur climbing robot. Moving to whether every facility should produce food is quite likely since real estate is going to be super limited within the habitat. We will of course need to have um, a dedicated greenhouse um, but additional food production systems built into every single facility within the habitat is a great way to ensure redundancy and self-reliance during adverse conditions. Any ships that are stationed around the habitat that have arrived or are waiting for, de for um, the window to, to depart should not be left untethered or exposed to the elements because dust storms and daily temperature variations between 20 degrees to like minus 73 degrees Celsius can cause quite a bit of damage. And since human and cargo movement will be required throughout the habitat, these routes will need to be maintained and kept clear of debris. So the final section that I kind of want to talk about was a, was um, a visual concept. 
an underground habitat is really attractive for the benefits that it could offer with respect to shelter and safety from radiation, um, safety from micrometeorites, dust storms, as well as temperature stability. But let's talk about lava tubes in the Tharsis region. Um, Mars's gravity is about 38% of that of Earth's. This allows for the lava tubes to be much bigger than those that are found on Earth. The challenge, of course, is that the exploration of the cave system itself will need to be conducted before any human entrance is possible. Now, although climbing bots could, be, could achieve this, um, eventually we will need to build ramps to ensure human access from the surface in a safe manner. The other challenge is redirecting sunlight into the system as well. Um, like the lava tubes that we have on Earth, the presence of sharp rocky material or shifting boulders or even uneven floors could, could pose quite a bit of challenge to any inflatable habitats that we, that we decide to house within these lava tubes. So in the early days, um, what you see here is AI Space Factory's multi-layered 3D printed habitat. Um, it could offer an overground alternative to a hab. This is an image from Fourth Planet Logistics, and it has imagined a fully underground facility with astronauts inhabiting lava tubes in inflatable habitats like the Bigelow, which we'll probably see in the next slide. So what I propose here is more of a hybrid approach, which is overground facilities for launch and storage of excavated materials, just fuels, um, and the underground facilities if found to be viable eventually would include living areas, logistics and water stores within the inflatable habitats themselves. And finally, moving to materials and machinery. 3D printing on Mars is quite likely to use ABS pellets, which will need to be carried as cargo from Earth because it's not available in situ. Basalt, which is in extruded from, um, which is very likely to increase tensile strength and hardness of the printed objects itself is available in situ, unlike ABS, but mining it on Mars is still an unsolved problem. Um, the other thing that is going to be quite challenging is creating composite material pellets on Mars itself. Now, if Martian habitats will be sustained within lava tubes, robotic exploration of these caves will require bots to be able to climb and or fly a shot out to ingenuity, um, solar powered on board Perseverance, which is going to test out flight on Mars for the first time in human history. So exciting. Um, the images you see over here is JPL's lemur foot, which has been tested on Earth as a climbing mechanism. Essentially, you have um, 16 fingers with about 250 um, really tiny latch hooks um, should be visible in the bottom right hand corner image um, to grasp uh, rocky rocky surfaces that that will allow it to scale. Um, a hybrid, which would be um, a hybrid of like ingenuity, something that can fly, as well as something that can land and perch on vertical surfaces, would probably allow for the most extensive um, coverage and exploration of. Um, of underground facilities and lava tubes. Um, these are some of the references that I have. And thank you very much for, um, for being here today. Um, and I'll take any questions, should you have any. Hello, Dr. Shankar, this is Susan. Um, we do have a few questions. Let me just scroll down here. Um, one person says, great point about redundancy of life support systems, i.e. food and oxygen. Yeah. And then another person says, given the complexity of finding mining and purifying water ice and the need for water early on in the colonization process, do you think the energetic cost of extracting water from the 0.03% in the atmosphere would be worthwhile? At the end of the day, I believe it's going to come down to a cost benefit analysis. Um, if it's, if, if you're looking at um, that minuscule percentage of atmospheric water available to us for extraction, um, it will need to be weighed against um, how costly it is to really to, to extract that water. Um, I, I still strongly uh, believe that regolith is going to be our best bet um, but if extraction is really cheap from oxygen, 
um, sorry, from from atmos from the atmosphere. Um, it would definitely be preferable. You, for one, you won't have to have that massive swarm of mining bots. Exactly. Uh, let's see a couple more. Uh, this one is excellent presentation, mm -hmm. uh, and I agree. Uh, do you think we would be able to use lava tubes directly for habitation, or would? Whoops. Hang on. Chat window's jumping. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or would? there need to be structural work, lining, supports, et cetera? Well, every, um, every evidence so far suggests that these lava tubes will be pretty stable um, and hopefully they won't collapse. Um, but I don't, I, I, I don't think it's very likely that we're gonna put humans in there without first A, testing whether the stability is warranted um, or that there aren't like moving and shifting boulders because that's quite likely to happen. It happens here on earth and be willing to bet that it happens on the moon and on the Mars. Um, so for sure, I think supports will be required. At the very least, you want to protect um, any inhabitants from like stray falling rocky material because you don't want that piercing into um, uh, folks' suits either because that can be pretty dangerous. Even the tiniest, sharpest uh, little rocks could do that. Excellent. Um, and so the next question is, would it be easier to mine water at the poles or in lava tubes in glaciers? Ooh, uh, that's a meaty one. I don't think I know the answer off, off, um, offhand, but um, I'm just thinking about the limitations of, um, of robotic enabled mining. Um, for us to do that, not um, like with, for us to mine within lava tubes, um, you'd have to get all of your mining bots have the ability to scale down the tubes, um, assuming that a, that a ramp already wasn't built, um, which means any kind of graspers, foot release, all of that will need to be adapted for both the mining situation as well as traversal through the tubes itself. Um, so if I had to bet, I'd start with water at the poles. Um, but then we're also confining, either, either confining ourselves to um, living next to the poles or transporting all of those all those excavated goods back to the habitat. Um, but if I had to guess, I'd go with mining at the poles, but uneducated <laughs> guess, so I won't put too much stake in it. Thank you. So next question is, what type of mission could be designed to specifically look for lava tubes from orbit? Are there specific sensors that would be ideal? Um, so the work that I've seen being done around that uh, around that region has mostly been with uh, with infrared sensors. They're looking for heat signatures. Um, the idea of uh, living within a ha within lava tubes, the most attractive part of it was that um, aside from the micrometeorites and uh, dust protection from storms, is that it offers um, temperature stability. Um, so. When you use infrared sensors for that, what you'd see is that certain regions that do not have lava tubes in them, um, you'll see temperature fluctuations through the day and they'd spike and, they'd, um, and they drop. Uh, but any regions that are covered with lava tubes, they remain um, far more stable. And that's, that's uh, actually how they found um, the, the dense little cluster of um, lava tubes in the Tharsis region. How many launches would it take to get a habitat up and running? So most of what we've talked about during, um, during our Habitat Mardi missions um, have, have kind of phased out, um, uh, have, have kind of phased habitat creation. So it typically starts with, okay, let's get one facility up, um, which will ensure that the one or two people that live there um, will have adequate food and oxygen. Um, and then multiple launches after would kind of increase and, and build on those habitats, assuming that things go as per plan. Um, as to the number of launches, the way we have been thinking about uh, these habitats, we have gone up to about, I think, um, between 15 to 20 people. Um, Imagine that imagining that phased out, I'd expect there to be at least three or four launches to carry all of our initial equipment in. And the last question is, how can we use technology to produce materials? 
Um, I'm wondering here if they're referring yeah. to 3D printers or, yeah. uh, John, you want to type a further uh, question there? If he's still here. Yeah, I think that's another one offset that I could uh, tackle while John responds. 3D printing vision. Okay, well, um, it's also also being answered within the <laughs> within the chat. Um, so Richard has, I think, responded to John's question also, which is 3D printing using um, Martian regolith and vitrified blocks. Um, so the the compressed blocks uh, of Martian regolith, I thought, would be a really neat use for uh, paving materials in uh, launch pads. Um, um, 3D printing um, is tricky. So the, the portion of my presentation that kind of covered that was just, just a little bit over here. Um, the hope is to use ABS pellets. It's cheap, it's easy, we know how to deal with it. However, ABS is not available in C2. So that could be something that we have to carry. Um, I saw this really, really neat paper that I was looking into, which used um, pellets that combined ABS with basalt, which is available in C2. Problem is we don't know how to mine basalt yet on Mars, um, as well as creating composite materials is non-trivial. Like they'd have to be heated up to really high temperatures and melted down. Um, um, so in so in all likelihood, like our first set of 3D printed materials will all be with um, materials that we take with us from Earth. Okay, I think uh, there's one more. We still have a little bit of time, but this this probably needs to be the last question because we have a very special guest uh, coming up. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Um, Jacob says, do you expect a lot of improvements for lava tubes or will it just be the last part of the adaptation of a habitation? I think it's going to be the last part. Um, your instinct is right. It's It's pretty complex. Um, it's non-trivial to live underground, not just the technological um, obstacles that wouldn't be overcome, but also uh, psychological things. Like if we aren't able to get light into every single portion of the lava tube, what does it mean for us to live underground without sunlight for extended period of, periods of time? We already know that it's something that uh, folks that live further away from the equator um, have trouble with during winter season. I know I'm going to have trouble with come winter not seeing the sun for too long. Um, so, and typically I find, you know, psychological barriers are always harder to overcome than technological barriers. So I think um, lava tubes, though attractive, uh, chances are we're going to come to it right at the end. So I see her question, uh, this is curious, I'm wondering about this myself, but um, Simon's asking about um, the benefit of temperature stability in the tubes rather than on the surface. And, and yeah. would that be helpful? Absolutely. Um, let's see. Oh, 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 over here. Yeah, so part of the reason why the tubes are so cool and so alluring for us to live in is temperature stability. Um, you, you won't have to deal with like 20 degrees to minus 73 during a single day. It protects us from micrometeorites, it protects us from dust. Um, so absolutely, temperature stability is one of the big reasons why, why, we're, why we would spend so much time investigating habitation within the lava tubes. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, all of the comments are, are saying how wonderful it was and we agree.